Just right off the bat, I'm gonna I'm gonna read from the story um, for a few minutes. Um, probably will not read the whole thing, um, so we can have some some time for questions um, afterwards. But um, I'll read the first uh, first bit of a story. Um, the story's title is Sundance. I'll just get right into it. Rand spent whole afternoon sitting in his trailer, head in his hands, blueprints and rolls on the tables around him, the water cooler giving an occasional verbal. Sometimes a shadow crossed the, crossed the sun, flocks of starlings coming down to perch, chattering in the trees. It was early spring. When the ice had come off enough, he took his boat up to the Bighorn Reservoir. He'd always liked fishing, but now he had a hard time concentrating on it. After a while, he stopped bringing a rod. He packed a sandwich, a thermos of coffee, and a six-pack of beer. He'd fill an extra gas tank and run upstream against the placid flow of the river, hugging the soaring canyon walls, hearing nothing but the drone of the outboard. When it was time for lunch, he'd nose the boat into a side canyon and tie off in the lee side of a boulder to get out of the wind. After the constant noise of the motor in his ears, he would taste the strange silence of the canyon, and Rand would feel for a moment that there had been a reprieve. He would sit perfectly still until something broke the silence, the boat rubbing against the rock, the croak of a passing raven, a fish jumping somewhere out across the lake. And then the spell was shattered, and he'd unpack his sandwich and drink his beer. He'd stare at the wild striations of the sandstone canyon walls and invent lives for the four men he'd killed. The crew leader's name was Angel. He spoke perfect English. As was usually the case, he'd hired his cousins and brothers to work for him. They did block, concrete flat work, and stone masonry. Rand had been using Angel's crew for a few years, always on time and dependable. He'd never found fault with their work. On the news, there'd been a story about a contractor in New Jersey who'd gotten 14 months in jail for hiring illegals to build a Walmart. There were sex offenders who got less time than that. If a man wanted to work, let him work. Official company policy, policy was that he needed a copy of a driver's license from any laborer on his job site. Some of the licenses they came in with looked like they'd been printed off at a Kinko's. Rand would laugh and shake his head on the way to the copy machine. The guys would leave the trailer grateful. A man who was appreciative of his job made the best worker. Rand had figured that out a long time ago. And everyone knew that the Mexicans were the best bricklayers around. Theirs was a country whose history could be sketched out in the transition from stacked stone to adobe brick to rebar enforced, re <coughs> rebar enforced concrete block. The weather that fall had been unusually bad. A foot of snow on the ground on Halloween day. By Thanksgiving, they were over a week behind schedule. It was a residential job. A huge stone and timber ski chalet style house in the Yellowstone Club ski resort development complex. The owner was some, some sort of tech genius. He made a fortune creating apps. Rand was peripherally, peripherally aware of what an app was. The guy wanted to be in the house by New Year's in time for his annual ski vacation. The place had a private lift line running up the mountain from the garage. Rand was pushing, paying out more in overtime than he would have liked. Then Thanksgiving hit. The thought of the project being stalled for one whole day at this stage set his teeth on edge. Angel's crew was in the process of building the large stone pillars that offset the main entrance, one of the final touches to be completed on the home's exterior. He was supposed to give the owner's representative a walkthrough soon. If they could get the pillars done, Rand thought that the whole endeavor would have a more finished feel, despite the fact that the interior was still a mess of raw, raw walls and floors and wires spewing from the sheetrock. On Thursday, none of the guys were going to be working. If there was one thing Rand had learned in his years on job sites, it was that you couldn't fuck with Thanksgiving. There was the holy trinity of football, food, and booze to contend with. The electricians and plumbers and Finnish carpenters had knocked it off on early on Wednesday afternoon. It was bitterly cold and supposed to only get worse. The next day was forecasted to reach zero degrees for a high. Ran sat in the job trailer all afternoon, looking out the window at the house, those damn unfinished pillars. 
Angel and his crew had the stone worked up about halfway, but there was at least two more full days of work to be done. The more Rand sat and looked at the pillars, the more he knew they needed to be completed before the walkthrough. He went out to talk to Angel. The masons were gathering their tools. Their big diesel was already running in the parking lot. The sky over the Spanish peaks was going a washed out pastel pink. He stood under the scaffolding, hands jammed into his pockets, waiting for Angel to finish what he was doing and climb down. Mexicans didn't celebrate Thanksgiving anyway. He figured it wouldn't be a big deal, that they'd want to work. They always wanted to work. As it turned out, they didn't want to work. I already told my guys to take the day off, Angel said. Sorry. Ran sighed and spit into the snow. Shit, man, I was really hoping you'd be able to make some headway on this thing tomorrow. Angel shrugged. It's going to be too cold anyway. We should have heaters as it is. The mud isn't setting up right. I consider it a big favor if you come in tomorrow, Rand said. I've got a walkthrough coming up. These pillars. If they're done, the whole thing looks more done. You know what I mean? Angel shrugged again. He was gathering an extension cord, wrapping it in loose coils around his arm from hand to elbow. Sorry, man. The guys already have plans. No one else is working anyway, right? I'll be here. Angel smiled. He was missing a canine, and Rand could see the pink mollusk of his tongue through the gap. But you're the boss, Angel said. No days off for the general. Okay, Rand said, sure. He kicked a little at a chunk of snow. I understand. He started to walk away and then stopped. He cleared his throat. Hey, he said, there's another thing that has recently come to my attention. Now, I just want to say this is coming from the higher ups, my boss, you know, I'm getting some pressure to verify that everyone in the job site is legal. I'm not implying anything, I'm just saying it could be an issue. Get me? Angel was still smiling. I was born in San Antonio, he said, squinting a little. Sure, I know that. Rand nodded towards Angel's crew up on the scaffolding, gathering their tools. I don't know about them, though, and up until this point it hasn't mattered. I'm just saying that that might change. Angel nodded slowly. And if we come in to work tomorrow? I don't foresee any problems, Rand said. Can I count on you? Angel's smile tightened. Heaters, he said. I'll get them set up tonight personally. Angel shouted up to his men and Rand headed back to the trailer. He didn't understand what Angel was saying, but he could tell his crew was unhappy. There was rapid fire Spanish grumbling. One of them threw a shovel down from the scaffolding and it hit an overturned metal mortar trough. There was a hollow boom that echoed, echoed once and then was swallowed up by the cold. It would be dark soon. An inversion cloud was forming over the distant peaks, a pewter sheet turned down over the sky. When everyone had left, Rand bundled up and pointed his truck so the headlights were on the house. He felt bad about coming at Angel that way. But that was sometimes the way things had to go. Years ago, Rand had thought that getting into the building trades would be a simple, straightforward, honorable profession. You made things with your hands, and at the end of the day, you had hard physical evidence of your effort. You wouldn't get rich, but if you slept, you wouldn't get rich, but you slept well. Sore muscles and a clear conscience, that sort of thing. That might have been true in the beginning. When he was a journeyman carpenter swinging his hammer for a paycheck, things had been much easier. But as it happened, he'd been good at his work and he'd advanced. He hadn't done any serious shovel work or walked Joyce in years. He wasn't complaining. He owned his own home. He had a fishing boat and his truck was paid for. It was just now at the end of the day, he had a harder time determining what it was he'd done. Managing people. That's what he concerned himself with these days. It was tricky, but he discovered he had an aptitude for it. He didn't have a construction management degree like many of the kids the companies hired now. He'd come up through the ranks, and he thought the men respected him for this. He knew what it was like to work for an hourly wage, to actually do the work. He was familiar with the grind. That was something you couldn't learn in college. Case in point, here he was, after dark, his truck thermometer had read minus 17, making a tent around the pillars and scaffolding with lengths of plastic sheeting. 
The plastic would retain the heat from the Forrester propane blowers. The stonemasons would get the pillar done in comfort. The walkthrough would go well. Rand dragged the heater in place, made sure the propane tank was full, gave one final look over his work, and was satisfied. He was halfway home before the pins and needles subsided in his fingers and toes. It really was brutally cold. He'd go home and he'd make a pot of coffee, put some bourbon in it, crank up the wood stove, go to bed early to wake up and do it all again. Thanksgiving be damned. Like Angel had said, he was the general. He had never once expected anything out of a worker that he himself was unwilling to do. That was fairness. Earlier that week, his friend Sam had invited him over for Thanksgiving dinner. Sam had just gotten married and was irritatingly happy. We don't acknowledge Thanksgiving for obvious reasons, Sam had said, but Stella decided to make a big old turkey dinner on Thursday. Just a coincidence, really. We'd love to have you. Sam was laughing and Rand could hear Stella scolding him playfully in the background. Sam's new wife was from Lodgegrass. She was a member of the Crow Nation. Her maiden name was Estella Marie stabs on top. <laughs> Sam was a short, pale blonde Swede from Minnesota. Stella was a long-limbed, black-haired woman of the plains. After their marriage, Sam and Stella had taken each other's names. They were now officially, unbelievably, Sam and Stella stabs on top Gunderson. It's for the kids we're eventually going to have, Sam explained. It's unfair, not to mention chauvinistic, to expect her to take my name. And our kids should grow up having a fair representation of their heritage present in their names. I mean, Gunderson is only half the story here. When he got to the site in the morning, they were already there, their radio blasting mariachi out into the snow-laden pines. It was the kind of brittle temperature that froze the mucus at the corners of your eyes, made your nose hairs prickle, made you cough if you breathed in too deep. Rand got the coffee going in the trailer and did some paperwork. Once he looked up from his desk to see a string of elk emerging from the edge of the timber. They looked patchy and miserable, their caution lost to the cold, moving aimlessly for warmth. At noon, Rand bundled up and went to check out the crew. He brought a case of Miller High Life, a peace offering. Angel nodded up at him when he ducked under the tarp, and Rand saw that they were making good progress. Warm enough in here, he shouted over the radio. Angel gave him a thumbs up. I brought you some Thanksgiving beer. Rand set the beer in a bucket and Angel gave him a double thumbs up. Okay, good work guys, I appreciate it Angel. I'm gonna take off, make sure the propane is unhooked when you leave. Angel nodded and shouted okay. His crew hardly looked at Rand. He wasn't sure how much English they understood, although it had always been his experience that they understood more than they let on. Rain went to dinner at the Stabs on Top Gunderson's and had a good time. He felt a little guilty about leaving work early, but he'd been caught up on his progress reports and would have just been sitting there twiddling his thumbs anyway. When they sat down to eat, Stella said, for, for the record, I have no problem with Thanksgiving. She pointed her fork at Sam. Who could argue with a holiday based on giving thanks for what you have? Sam shrugged. I'm going to eat the hell out of this turkey, but I just want everyone to know that that is no way indicative of me endorsing this gluttonous festival of oppression. They ate and drank too much, and then all pitched in on the dishes. Rand watched Stella and Sam as they bantered and snapped each other with dish towels and talked about their unborn children, as if there were not so much possibilities as certainties that just hadn't happened yet. Rand rarely wasted too much time thinking about women. He'd spent enough years on construction jobs to know that this put him in the minority among men. There was a Korean massage parlor in Billings that he visited once a month. The women there were probably closer to 50 than 40, but he didn't mind. They were good, natu good natured, motherly almost. He tipped well, and if they didn't have another customer right away, sometimes he stayed and had a cup of barley boricha with them. Occasionally, he fixed things around the place that needed attention. He hadn't had a serious girlfriend in 10 years. After dinner, Rand returned to his empty house. Everything was in its place, and if it wasn't, it was because he was the one who had misplaced it. 
that was comfort. The wood stove was casting its glow in the living room and he made himself a whiskey and sat in the recliner. He switched on the TV and watched some sports highlights. He didn't think his life lacked for much of anything. At least there were no holes that couldn't be filled by getting a dog. Last spring, his old lab Charlie had gone to chase the big tennis ball in the sky. He thought that enough time had passed now and maybe he'd go look at the shelter sometime soon. The day after Thanksgiving, he got to the job site early. He figured he'd be the first one there and could do a walk around to see what was what before any of the crews showed up. He was somewhat surprised to see Angel's truck in the parking lot. It had snowed a bit overnight, just a couple powdery inches, but it was enough to cover the tire tracks in the parking lot. No one had come or gone this morning. He couldn't figure out why Angel's rig was still there. It just didn't make sense, really. There were no tracks to the port john to the lift, to the pallets of stone, no tracks of any kind. A white blanket of snow. Comple completely quiet until a jay shrieked in the pines. Rand was out of the truck now, walking fast and then slowing, stopping. There was a dark shape push pushing against the semi-opaque plastic around the pillars where Angel's crew had been working. When he got closer, he could see the shape had a face. Rand wanted to turn, run, get into the truck and drive, but he forced his feet to move, kicking through the snow. He ducked under the plastic. It was cold. The propane tank must have run empty. They were all there, three men slumped on the scaffolding, an angel sitting back against the stone pillar, eyes closed as if he were taking a nap. Rand knew immediately it was impossible to mistake it for anything else. It was carbon monoxide, they told him. Somehow the heater exhaust had been covered by the tarp, filling the area the men were working in with deadly fumes. Two of the men, Angel's cousins, had been illegal after all. There was a delay in the construction while the situation got sorted out, but then, sooner than seemed decent, they were back at it. A new crew came in to finish the stonework. The carpenters and electricians wrapped up the interior, and not long after the first of the year, Rand's trailer got hauled away and the whole affair was complete. He never actually met the homeowner. The final inspection was handled by the app genius's wife. She had their young son with her, happily running and sliding in his stocking feet on the new wood floors. Donald can't, get, can't wait to get away, she said, leaning, leaning against the kitchen aisle, uh, island, tousling her son's hair. He is so busy right now working on a product launch. He checks the snow report three times a day. He really loves to ski. I like it okay. I'm not very confident, though. This little guy is going to get lessons this year. Donald is adamant about starting him out young. He says a child has to start before he has a real fear of falling. That's the best way. I didn't start until I met Don, which was too late, really. Rand was nodding. He'd never skied in his life. So, he said, if you don't have any more questions, I'm going to get out of your hair. I'll leave you this refrigerator magnet here. It has the company's contact info and my personal cell phone. If anything, and I mean anything, comes up, please don't hesitate to call me. When Rand turned to leave, she followed him to the door. She stood on the threshold, one hand on the door, perfectly manicured nails tapping on the knob. She looked back into the house to make sure her son wasn't within earshot. There was one thing, she said. I heard about what happened. Those workers. I've been handling most of the details about this house. I've never even told Don because I knew he would worry, but I just... Well, this might be weird, but I have to know, were they in the house? I mean, actually, inside when it happened? It shouldn't matter, it's such a tragedy, but for some reason I'd like to know exactly where they were um, discovered. She had a small, fixed smile on her face. Rand thought that this was a woman who was used to being found ridiculous. Her husband, a tediously practical man, was no doubt in the habit of acquiescing to her desires, but not without first patronizing her. 
Rand had a brief urge to lie, to hear her, to tell her Angel and his men had been working on the stone fireplace, that he'd found them slumped right there on her living room floor where her kid was slipping around in his socks. He wanted to give credence to her fear somehow, but he couldn't because she had that smile, the fragile kind. Outside, he said, they were working on the entryway. They never even went into the house. God, it shouldn't matter, she said hurriedly. It's just such bad energy, a horrible way to christen a beautiful chapter in our lives. And after all the work you've done, I mean, this place is fabulous. You must be very proud. Something like that is such a detraction. Rand shrugged. It was unfortunate, an accident. They were good workers. I didn't know them well. She nodded and crossed her arms under her breasts, hugging herself. She must have been cold in the doorway with no coat. I'm going to put up a wreath, she said, right on the entryway there. It's not much, but it'll be my own little memorial. I don't think I'm going to tell Don. It's not something he'd deal with well. Rand shook her hand and got in his truck and never set eyes on the house or its occupants again. After Rand told him about the accident, Sam was constantly inviting him to do things with him and his new bride. Come over for dinner, Rand. Stella is making spaghetti. We just out at Jake's. Stella and I are going for a drink. Stella and I are going camping. You should come along. Rand managed to wriggle out of most of these invitations. The latest was Sam wanted Rand to join him in a sweat lodge ceremony. This is just what you need, man. It's purifying. I did one last month, and I felt like I'd been wrung out and hung out. You know what I mean? In a good way. I felt light. Rand had been avoiding Sam, not returning his calls. And then one evening, as Rand was loading up in his truck to head home after work, Sam pulled in, blocking his way. Hop in, Sam said. We're going to be late. What? I'm going home. I'm tired. No, we've got sweat lodge tonight. I told everyone I was bringing a friend. They're expecting you. Let's go. I brought you a towel. Sam drove them out of town and then on a series of ever narrowing roads that wound back into the hills. The sun was setting behind them as they pulled up in front of a pale blue trailer house. There were half a dozen other vehicles parked in the drive. Two paint ponies stood motionless in a corral. There was an elk skull and antlers in the trailer house roof, long tapering lodge poles leaning like massive knitting needles against the porch railing. This is Stella's grandparents' house, Sam said. They raised her. They're different from most of the people around here. They brought her up in the way that they themselves have been raised. Traditional, you know. They still follow the old ways. The old ways? Yeah. Notice, for example, the fact that they don't have a satellite dish on their roof. Everyone out here has a satellite dish. Stella told me they just got electricity a few years ago. They used to spend the whole summer in a lodge up in the Bighorns, a teepee rant. They lived half a year in a teepee, gathering berries, fishing, hunting, living. That's why my wife is so beautiful, right? She was running wild out in the hills as a kid, not drinking Pepsi, and watching the real world and working at a casino, living shabbily off whatever scraps we tossed their way. We, yes, we, call me crazy, but I feel like in some small way, she and I are doing some sort of small mending in the huge terror that we made in these people's universe. I didn't tear anyone's universe. I don't want to do this. I'm just going to sit in the car. Nonsense. They've adopted me, Rand. I'm family and you're my guest. It's going to be great. Trust me. Moments later, Rand stood shivering in his underwear in front of a low canvas-colored dome. There was a fire going outside, rounded river rocks piled in the blaze. He could hear talking and laughing coming from the lodge. Sam motioned for him to follow and ducked into the low entrance. A furious wave of wet heat hit Rand upon entering. He coughed and dropped to his knees next to Sam, sweat already pouring from his face and shoulders. It was dim, faces periodically appeared in the steam. There were a half dozen men seated around a pit filled with rocks, and Rand watched a man, his bare torso shiny with sweat, reach out of the lodge with a pair of large metal fireplace tongs 
and bring a rock from the outside fire. The rock was still glowing faintly red in the gloom, and he placed it carefully on the other rocks in the central pit. He did this twice more, and then squirted water from a two-liter soda bottle onto the rocks. There was a great hiss, and huge gouts of white-hot steam filled the air. Then, a noise like a rifle shot in the enclosed area as one of the rocks split. Rand swore and flinched, and there was soft laughter from the shadows. The increase in steam made Rand feel as if his skin were being parboiled from his body. Relax, man, Sam said, smiling, his blonde hair plastered to his skull with sweat. Focus on your breathing. Sam introduced him all around. All of them were relatives of Stella, brothers, cousins, uncles, and the oldest, her grandfather. Long, thinning gray hair, small, compact belly, and skinny crossed legs. The old man was staring at him. Rand lowered his head and concentrated on taking shallow breaths. Hey, the old man said, how tall are you? Rand looked around. The old man was still staring at him. One eye perfectly black, the other, the other with scalded milk skim, scalded milk skim, skim of cataract. Me? Yeah, what are you, like 6'2", six 6'3", six something like that? I'm 6'3". The old man nodded as if this confirmed suspicion he'd held all along. So you're a forward, maybe a small forward? I'm saying that only because you don't look quick enough to be a shooting guard. No offense. I, what? The old man raised his arm and pointed across the lodge. That's Nolan, my grandson. He's going to take us to the championship this year. He's not real tall, but he's got a quick release. Quickest release off a screen I've ever seen. A leaper, too. Nolan can jump right out of the gym. Only a sophomore this year, and college coaches are coming to watch him play. Gonzaga, that's big time. What do you say, Nolan? Nolan scratched his head and wiped the sweat from his face. Rand thought he looked to be about 40 with a sunken chest and the burst nose of a serious drinker. I don't know, Grandpa, Nolan said. I'm going to try. There was silence in the lodge for a few, mo few minutes, and then someone on the other side said, Hey, Sam, you're looking skinny. My sister's cooking, not agreeing with you? Soft laughter, then another voice from the steam. Uh, it's not the cooking. I got married once. I'm guessing she's keeping him fed just so she can wear him out at night. Succubus, no one said, pouring water on his face. All the women in this family. I believe I warned him before they got hitched. Suck what? Shit. My ex-wife? Under my birthday, if I was lucky. You young guys have it better. MTV, that's what did it. And all the hormones in the water makes women shameless. And Bill Clinton, it's not even sex anymore. Sam was laughing, shaking his head. Rand watched, not saying anything, sweat stinging in his eyes. Sam was part of some sort of unlikely brotherhood, a side effect of marriage that Rand had never before considered. It seemed like a good thing, but he didn't let, him, he didn't let himself get too sentimental. In reality, while the stabs on top men adopting Sam into the fold meant friendship, sweat lodges, manly companionship, it probably also included the occasional jailhouse call for bail money. Eventually the heat overwhelmed Rand and he had to stumble out of the lodge before he fainted. He stood outside in his soaked underwear, steam rising from his shoulders and arms, his neck craned back to look at the stars. <clears throat> out here, town wasn't even a glow on the horizon. As Rand was trying to find the Big Dipper, there was a soft whistling a flock of mergansers up from the river, flying low over his head, dark swimmers, moving in formation against the flow of the Milky Way. The men were laughing in the lodge, and then he could hear Sam's voice rising up a little above it, and then it was quiet. He knew they had been talking about him, and he thought it was ridiculous of Sam to bring him here. He decided he wasn't going to go back in. He stood, shivering, listening to the horses breathing in the corral. 
The poor old guy's got Alzheimer's, Sam said in the car on the way home. It's an unfortunate thing. Sometimes he's perfectly clear, everything is clicking. He tells stories about his childhood and older ones, you know, legends and stuff, the history of the people. It's really great. And then sometimes he gets on his basketball kick. He used to be a coach. It's just ungodly what it does to a person. Anyway, I'm glad you came with me tonight. Stella and I, you know, we worry about you, man. I'm fine. It was her idea about the sweat lodge and she thinks you need a girlfriend. I've been thinking about getting a dog. Well, there you go, I'll tell her that. Sam, dro Sam dropped him off back at his truck and when he drove away, Rand walked across the parking lot down to the new job site. <clears throat> they were building a massive ski chalet style dentist office. They had floors poured and the walls framed in. The roof was still an empty framework of jutting steel beams. He overturned a bucket and sat with his back to a wall, looking up at the moon, coming up bloody egg, egg yolk orange. He thought behind the roof, jo roof joists like that, it looked like some sort of mottled internal organ. Thank you. <laughs> Getting a little dry up here. <laughs> um, a pulsing lunar heart lodged between the ribs of a giant skeleton. For some reason, he couldn't stop thinking about Nolan, the basketball star, a great leaper with a quick release, the obviously ruined alcoholic. Had he led the Harden Tigers to the state championship all those years ago? Maybe in the finals game he'd choked, missed the potentially game-winning free throw, and then started his downward slide. No championship banner, no Gonzaga, no longer any reason to stay in shape. The new dedication to drinking, puking in cold frozen fields, pick up games in the dingy rec center gym where that free throw went in every time. Maybe some people wouldn't think something like that was possible, that such a small event could precipitate so great a fall. Everything in a man's life hanging on a hoop, a net, the soft spin of the pebbled leather kissing the fingertips goodbye on the release. Rand was not one of these people. I think I'm going to stop there um, so we have time for questions and me talking. Um, it's quite warm in here. Uh, <laughs> So um, the story goes on. It doesn't get any more cheerful or um, <laughs> sunny, I will say. Um, but uh, as, as Grant indicated, I am um, uh, a fishing guide. Um, I'm here in France for a few months on a residency. Um, I, uh, I tend to call myself a seasonal writer in that um, I don't really write in the summer. Um, my fishing job is very busy. It's kind of all encompassing, um, long days. Um, so I write in the winter. Um, and this winter I happen to be, happen to be in France for a few months. Um, bit of a culture shock, not gonna lie. Um, Montana and Paris are um, not incredibly similar. Um, uh, there's a lot more cheese here. Um, people holding baguettes. Um, but uh, I will say the, the, the readers in France seem to be quite amazing um, and enthusiastic um, and, um, and passionate about reading. Um, I think many French people that I've talked to have been interested in the short story um, because I think there's this conception amongst French readers, maybe that the short story is very popular in America or more popular in America than it is here. Um, which I'm not sure if is true or not. I think at one time it definitely was. Um, uh, I've been very lucky to get a collection of short stories published, but it, it seems to be quite difficult now. Um, the, many of the kind of venues, traditional venues, publications for the short story have kind of dried up um, in the States. There's you know, The New Yorker, basically. Um, Granta still publishes short stories. Harper's in the Atlantic occasionally. Um, so, um, the short story is kind of, um, there's a lot of people writing them, um, like MFA students graduating, um, but not a lot of um, um, 
venues for them to go. Um, anyway, um, I do like the short story. However, the question that everyone seems to ask is, uh, when is your novel going to be done? Um, <laughs> and uh, that is what I've been doing here mostly. So I did finish a novel draft, which I'm happy um, to say. And we'll see. I'll be still working on it. But um, it's kind of like as a fiction writer, you're not a real writer until you have a novel. Um, so <laughs> hopefully um, next year at this time, that will be the case for me. But um, I don't really ramble on about... Um, the writing, but does anyone have a question, potentially? Yes. Yeah, um, it's a big part of my stories. Um, uh, I, I think I really admire writers who can um, just kind of create these fantastic worlds. You know, um, I, my imagination is not that great, so I have to write about uh, places I'm pretty familiar with. Um, like, uh, I have a hard time writing a story um, about a place where I don't know the trees um, or like, what the people do there for work, things like that. Um, even if those things aren't actually in the story, I feel like I need to know those things to write an authentic story. Um, so um, that's one thing. I think uh, in many of my stories, the, the environment is almost kind of like a, another character. Um, the, the, the stories I'm, I'm writing, where they're set, the, the environment plays a large role, um, it, it, as would be the case if I was writing about New York, New York or, or something, I would say, but um, wherever you set the story it does take a, um, it does make a mark on, on what the characters do in the story. So um, it's a big thing for me. Many of the, the stories um, in the book have um, characters kind of struggling um, in many ways, but in, in one of the, the most ba basic ways is struggling with um, the forces of nature, as it were. So it's an important thing for me. Yeah. <laughs> Paris chose me, um, kind of. Um, um, it's kind of a long story, but I was fortunate enough to get awarded a, a residency in Vincennes. Um, so um, I've been doing that. I've been visiting some schools, um, visiting some um, libraries, things like that. But it also kind of coincided with um, the French publication of my book. So it was translated into French. Um, Francis and Carol, my editors here. Um, so they were kind enough to have me come over. So I've been doing some promotion stuff as well because it came out, the French edition came out in September. So um, I've been able to go to a number of small towns outside of Paris, which has been pretty cool. Um, seeing a bit of the country, um, the, uh, the small bookstores outside of Paris seem to be especially um, vibrant um, and uh, you know, the people in some of the towns seem to come out for a, a writer on a, you know, Saturday night. Um, it's a, some form of entertainment, so it's, it's been nice to talk to folks like that. So, yeah. Um, I think um, the, the French people seem to... Um, I also got it translated into German as well, um, but the French in particular seem to be receptive to stories about, set in or about the American West um, for a number of reasons, but um, um, Francis heads up a department of Alba Michel that is kind of um, specializes in publishing writers of the Americas, so um, I think that's, that's why it happened, but um, there's a lot of great American writers with the tradition of publishing, publishing in, in France, um, Paris. Many writers have come to live here, so um, I think it's it's a good market to crack if you can as an American. Yeah. Um, I do, but um, it is uh, it's it can be a challenge. Um, I, I've been reading more nonfiction lately. Um, since I've been writing more fiction, I, I have been enjoying reading nonfiction. But 
I feel like it's enough to just be reading a different genre of fiction. So if I'm writing short fiction, I'll read novels. And if I'm trying to write a novel, I'll read more short fiction. Just something slightly different because otherwise what seems to happen is, um, you know, it, it's hard to not compare what you're reading to what you're working on. And in my case, usually whatever I'm reading is much better than what I'm working on. And so it's a bit depressing. So, um, yeah, I, I've been reading a lot of nonfiction, which is great because um, it's, a, it's a whole world of discovery there. And that, that often kind of feeds into um, my fiction in, in, in certain ways. So. Um, so, um, as a kid, um, I didn't have a TV in my house. Uh, my parents raised me with no television, and so I came to the library all the time. Um, and I uh, checked out big stacks of books, um, like paperback westerns, um, not, not necessarily good literature, but uh, I did read a lot as a kid, um, a tremendous amount. And um, that's, you know, it's kind of continued in my life. So I would say it's the same for most writers. You get your start writing via reading. Um, if you read enough, eventually you kind of want to try your hand at creating something. Um, I wrote a lot of really bad poetry for a lot of years. Um, finally kicked that habit. Uh, it's good, probably. I'm sure, you know, my, my parents have some of my embarrassing poetry in the basement somewhere. Hopefully it never sees the light of day. Um, most of my poems, I think, were just stories that I was too kind of lazy to fully write. So um, I, uh, when I stopped that, things, things went better for me. Yeah. Um, I just hadn't read it in a long time. It's probably not a good one to read for that reason, but um, it wasn't the full story. It goes on for a while, a, wh a while, another ten, six pages, something like that. Um, I don't know. I just hadn't looked at it in a while. Some of these stories seem kind of old to me. Um, it, the book did come out in the states um, last year, and how publishing works is, I was done with the words themselves like a year before the book actually comes out. So. You know, I'd been done writing this book almost three years ago. Um, so I tend to read the same story every time at these events, and then occasionally I just want to read something different. So that's the answer to that, basically. You just, no, 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 no. Although it did, it seems kind of timely. There was like a reference to Thanksgiving in there, which is kind of coming up. So that was about as far as I went when I was thinking about what to read. <laughs> Thanksgiving. Um, let's see, recently I've read um, and really enjoyed uh, Arctic Dreams by Barry Lopez. Um, I read a book, uh, the title is The Emerald Mile. Um, it's about these guys that set a speed record down the Grand Canyon of the Colorado um, in a dory, which is like a hard-sided wooden rowboat. Um, it's a pretty epic story. It involves a lot of like history of, of the Grand Canyon. Um, let's see. Um, Empire of the Summer Moon. I read that one a little while ago. That one was extremely good. Um, kind of history of the um, Comanche, essentially. Um, won a big prize in the States. I can't remember which one, but it's a great book. So those are a few that I've been reading in the past you know, couple months. Um, the good thing about this residency is that it has allowed me to read a lot, so um, I've been reading quite a bit. Some novels as well. Um, I read um, Tim Winton's Dirt Music, Australian guy, um, really great writer. Um, and let's see, I just finished um, uh, uh, Return to the Dark Valley by Santiago Gambora. So, Colombian writer, I believe. Um, quite good. He was just in France. Drank a bunch of wine with him. So, <laughs> so I recommend that book highly. I think my single favorite thing about being here is uh, 
just walking around. Um, I just do, since I, I'm living in Vincennes, which is kind of out there, um, most days I walk into the city um, somewhere. Like I walked here today, it takes me you know, an hour and a half or two hours and you just kind of see things. Um, that's my single favorite thing, I think, is just walking around in the city. Because it's very, uh, it's very, it's a novel experience for me. Um, because walking in Montana is quite different. Um, so there's, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of stimulus here. Um, kind of overwhelming at times. Often I have to just go and sit in my apartment with the doors locked as well. Um, and not go outside. But um, wandering around has been great. Um, and the people I've met. Um, have been really nice to me, so, yeah. Yeah, um, the novel's been quite difficult for me. I've written a couple bad ones um, that are just going to stay in my desk drawer. Um, uh, the thing about a novel is that um, there's a lot of middle. Um, short stories, a lot of beginning, a lot of ending, two things I like, um, beginnings and endings. Um, that applies to my dating life as well as my writing. Um, but uh, the novel has so much middle, um, which tends to be um, boring for me. So the hardest thing I think for me is, is continuing or keeping a narrative push going through the middle pages. Like, what do you write about in that middle part that? Um, that won't be boring. Um, that's been that's been difficult for me. Also, I feel like many many novels, even good novels, um, there's just a lot of stuff in there that, um, as a short story writer, I look at and I'm like, oh, that could have been cut. That could have been trimmed. I want to turn every novel into a really good short story. Um, so, uh, in writing a novel, I guess you have to be um, you have to be willing to just kind of write some sentences, paragraphs, maybe like pages that like aren't perfect um, in order to, um, you know, hit a required page length that you can call a novel and your publisher will, you know, will take. <laughs> so um, there's just a, a certain amount of bullshitting you have to do in a novel that you don't have to do in a short story, I feel like. Um, but I'm very much trying to figure that process out still, so I don't have great answers on that one. It's a good question, though, because they do seem very different to me, um, the two things. So. All right. Thank you for coming. <laughs>